Hi, I'm Matt with Schematical, and today I'm with Romaric <laughs> Philo. Okay, <laughs> I knew I was going to try it. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'm going to let you actually pronounce it because I, I am going to butcher it. So, Romaric, go ahead, feel free to introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's uh, Romaric Philogen from Covery. Yeah, happy to be here. I'm a CEO and co-founder of, uh, of Covery. I would explain what we are doing, but I know that it's a bit complicated, like a name, like for like uh, the three or uh, <laughs> the three ones. So yeah, happy to be here. Well, great. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm going to start with a bit of a curveball question. It's going to sound weird, but uh, you're a computer science teacher, it says on your LinkedIn to present. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's something that I'm still like doing on my free time. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing. I love like just uh, teaching people uh, about like uh, how do they can just uh, connect, uh, code, code, and take advantage of like uh, coding, especially in Python. Uh, I'm doing it like in uh, with other languages, but uh, yeah, I'm spending some time just like to teach kids, uh, people that they are changing like from uh, one type of job to the other, and especially like in the. Uh, computer science space so yeah yeah good catch <laughs> yeah excellent all right no I was, I was very curious when i saw that um i figured that might come because you're amazing at presenting your product most of it you're a technical founder right so i mean yeah, you are because you're, so it's most of us technical guys are not nearly as good at communicating about their projects and you are quite incredible so uh, I've, I've been following your linkedin and, and you've got just the the way you present it is is like a teacher. It's really is, is nice. So I, I yeah. just wanted to make sure I called that out. So speaking of the product, uh, what are you building right now? What is uh, Kirovri? Am I saying that even yeah. close? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I wanted just to like uh, respond to the, the the one that you mentioned that I'm just communicating well on what I'm doing. But it's just all about passion. Uh, I think uh, you can do like a great stuff when you are passionate. You can just like uh, explain tons of different things and just take the time to just doing it properly. So that's something that I really enjoy. And just to respond to the ones like uh, what's Covery. So basically, Covery is an internal developer platform. We we try to help just like developers to be able to be a bit more autonomous inside the organizations, like making sure that the DevOps that they are like managing, like infrastructure and building the right pipelines for the developers can just provide the right experience to their developer developers and engineering team and that's what we do provide if you want like in some way you can see Corey as a aeroq like platforms that you get inside your companies but the devops people they can just plug that platform into their like working environment inside of their ci cd pipelines uh, on top of their cloud infrastructure and take advantage of like what the what the cloud can provide at the best uh, and provide that the, the, the right experience, like the perfect experience to the, the engineering team, basically. That's what we do. Yeah. Nice. So um, I, I'm on a project right now where we were using Flux and Helm, and we decided to rip it out because they were just such a pain. And I wonder if we found your product earlier, would it have been, you know, would it have been a good solution to substitute for that? And I, I wish we would have found it a little earlier, but. Now we're going to vanilla ECS and just using AWS tools uh, just because those yeah. open source solutions were untenable for their team. Their team isn't a large team, so they just don't have like a lot of people to maintain. Yeah, so. that's a, yeah, 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 yeah. I can, I can imagine and I can relate on that. And that's exactly what we are seeing. Also, some companies actually that they are using. So they, they came from like a Flux, Argo CD, so those kinds of platforms that they've built internally. And the beauty of Covery is that we we don't try to, to we don't try to replace like everything that you have already already done. So if you have already configured like some Elm charts, you have already obviously your Docker file and some other stuff. We try to be as pluggable as possible, so you can take advantage of what you have already done. Yeah. Awesome. That is great. So um, now we've talked a bit about the product. I want to know about your infrastructure. How are you hosting it? So the reason I found you was a post I've got right here, um, which actually after reading through the comments, you've got a whole bunch of interesting comments there. But uh, you guys uh, were uh, on, on AWS primarily, right? Is that correct that your back end is all on AWS? I'm assuming it's Kubernetes yeah. in some capacity. Yeah. So yeah, actually, I, you go ahead and tell me. Yeah, go ahead and let me know what it is. Yeah, that's that's exactly uh, that's something. So we are running on top of AWS. So we have our control plane that is running on AWS. The beauty is that we eat our own dog food. We are deploying Covery with Covery. So we do manage like the Covery, <laughs> the Covery control plane with Covery itself. 
And the way that our product works is that, as I told you, um, we we operate like infrastructure, like we orchestrate infrastructure on uh, the, the, our customers' infrastructure. So our customers, they can install Kobe on their own cloud account. And what happens is that we install a binary, so inside the infrastructure, so that is running on Kubernetes, and Kobe takes care of creating, like spinning up, if you don't have anything like in place, spinning up the VPC security groups, uh, the cluster, the Kubernetes cluster, and install Kobe on it. And then we have this Kobe, what we call Kobe engine, that is just an agent that is connecting to our control plane and pulling tasks from our control plane to be executed. But on the part of Kobe, so on the Kobe part, the control plane, yes, it's running on AWS. And we are using Kubernetes under the hood just to make sure that we still keep our applications up and running, even if we have like some outage on AWS, obviously. Nice. So, how are you uh, handling the scale there? Are you, you know, is it, do you know if it's Fargate or are you guys using, you know, EC two? I mean, obviously EC two under the hood. Or, or how are you handling uh, the scaling, um, scaling yeah. up or scaling down for demand? Yeah, it's pure like traditional uh, EKS cluster with EC two instances under the hood. So, yeah, that's very like uh, traditional setup. Uh, in terms of scaling, the beauty is that uh, I've written down like a post explaining how we handle that. Actually, we delegate as much as possible to the, so the way that works our system is a kind of star system. So you have the control plane, okay, that is just like giving instructions to the uh, remote systems that are running on the infrastructure of our customer, okay, on their own cloud account. And they pull tasks from the control plane. So what does that mean? It means that actually the way that we've built our control plane is made in a way that we can just scale to thousands like to clusters management in terms of Kubernetes cluster management. Okay, so uh, customers uh, without, e without even scaling like out our infrastructure because everything is delegated. So all the operations actually is, are delegated like to the infrastructure of our customers. So it's a pure remote system. It's highly resilient because even if something goes wrong on our control plane, every uh, single infrastructure of our customer, they're like completely autonomous. You see, so that, mm -hmm. that's the beauty of our system. Actually, we are just receiving. So what happened is that the engine, so the, the part that is running on the cloud infrastructure of our customer, they are just pulling tasks from our control plane. They are completely autonomous. So they do execute those tasks, okay? And they report back like to our control plane. But if our control plane is not like available, the infrastructure of our customer they are completely autonomous. You see? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so so um so for how that control plane talks to the you know, the running binary in their system is that a persistent connection like a socket connection like it reaches out to you guys? Yeah. Or, okay. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a G G GRPC like, connections that is initiated like over HTTP uh, two. Uh, to our control plane. So, yeah, so that's the way it works. So it's really like the agents or the engine running on the cloud infrastructure. So our, our customer infrastructure that is connecting, initiating the connections to uh, our control plane and not the opposite. Yeah. Okay. Are there, is there uh, any event-driven architecture on your side? Do you guys use queuing or anything like that to uh, you know help distribute the load and put it in the back end? Yeah, actually, we have built our own system. So if you look at Kobe, we are uh, nothing nothing more than just a scheduler in some way. We have a good experience, like very good experience for developers. And we have built our own internal system, like that is very simple, actually, that we are using where we are using Redis, okay, to just a queue task. We have our scheduler that is written in Rust. Uh, actually, we have one part that is written in, a, we have multiple components on the control plane. So some parts are written in Rust, uh, uh, some uh, one Big part is written in Kotlin, uh, that is quite interesting as well. And basically, what we do is that we queue all the tasks inside like a Redis, just basic like Redis instance, okay? And we pull like those tasks and we execute them like over time, so we can just like make sure that we pull, we don't lose anything, even if we restart like the application, and we are tracking down like all of that. Yeah. Okay. So for for your so you're using Redis, is that on Elastic Cache? Uh, not even, to be honest, okay. uh, I right. do think it's, I do think it's like just a container instance. Okay. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I, I do think it's a container instance, but to be honest, that's something that, uh, I need to double check just the one. <laughs> that's all right. I'm going to switch to a different question is, uh, how many developers do you have working on this right now? 
Yeah, actually in the team today we are 15. Uh, okay. So we are quite small team, but everyone, like even our product manager, they're like all engineers. Uh, and uh, but we are mostly composed of the we have uh, maybe we have five backend engineers, like all super experienced, like senior engineer, and we have uh, two front end engineers, like today in the team. So okay. and. Uh, I don't count myself as an engineer because I'm no longer working on the products. I'm working on the product, but not on the technical side. Thanks for my guys, because trust me, yeah, I'm good technical guy, but it's just better that I extract myself from all of that. Gotcha. <laughs> it's better for the stability of the platform. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Okay, well, then, so now, so I'm going to ask you what the internet is going to have as a controversial question, but do you have more of a monolithic, like, single code base architecture, or are you guys more microservices? And I Actually, guess it's I know the answer. Go ahead. Yeah, it's microservices. That okay. We all yes, right, all right. Yes, that's... it's... It's ma microservices. That's a very good question because you know we were used to, you you know you have like those trends. So we started all with monolithic applications that you had to break down like those applications into microservices. You had even like the function as a, uh, fun function services in some way, like very like a function way of like structuring like, your your application. And uh, and now we are at the stage where it's uh, microservices can be like a quite uh, quite interesting and quite great. In our case, it works perfectly well because actually it's much more like easier just to maintain like a bit code base. So all the business logic is inside the Kotlin code base that we have, basically. So all the different rules and the business logic that we need just to make a, a working properly uh, recovery. And we have some critical critical ele elements that they are like just handling a lot of loads that are written in Rust. Uh, for instance, we have a gateway that is receiving all the hooks, all the information from GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, for instance, because you can uh, cover it, can hook your repository. And then when you do like a commit and you push that commit, then we'll just deploy automatically your application. That kind of information is where we can, since we have like thousands of users, we have more than 50,000 like users using the platform, we can re receive like a lot of like requests uh, for coming from like those different uh, Git providers. And those pieces, even the scheduler is written in Rust, the most critical parts are written in Rust just to make sure that everything works well uh, at the runtime, you see? So it's mostly microservices that we have. We don't use microservices at all. Okay. Uh, how are the microservices communicating primarily? Um, I mean, I'm guessing you said you're an event-driven architecture, so I would assume like a commit comes in to GitHub. GitHub does a web request, a RESTful web request, push to your, I'm guessing your GitHub service or something like that, and then it probably pops that into a queue for consumption by a worker, pop it out, and then yeah. if I'm describing yeah. it, maybe the, uh, the, the binary running on your customer's servers detects that and does a deploy. Yeah, actually, we are using Redis as a queuing system. Very simple, like a queuing system. Okay. So, yeah, to get like high throughput, uh, basically, um, the requests, they are like uh, treated. We, we try to not get like uh, too much uh, things like uh, stored in the in the queue. We try to have like a kind of like a live system. Okay. And Redis is used as a queuing system to talk, like to make the different components working all together, basically. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question about, see, I'm a real infrastructure nerd, so I'm, so I'm going to nerd out over this, but a uh, question on scale, That's, do you guys have a, uh, sharding, um, you know, sharding by customer ID or something like that? Do you have a plan for that? Actually, very good question as well. Uh, I love those technical and architectures. Like we really try, this is where you see that uh, you have a very experienced team as well. We try to keep the things very simple. Mm -hmm. We don't okay. try to introduce like a complex concept where we don't need, we project ourselves. And this is where you see that you have an experienced team. Uh, for instance, the people that they are working at Curry, we were at Criteo, Red Hat, Ulink. We were managing thousands of like databases and servers, like at very large scale and uh, like with high throughput, like very high constraint. And we have seen like very big architectures and in those situations, what we try to do is really keeping the things very simple because when you have like performance issues, when you have downtime, it's much, much more like simple just to like get into like the resolution phase uh, because of the simplest like uh, architecture choice that you made. And that's exactly those things that we keep 
we kept as much as possible at Covery. We have no charts, actually. Everything stick to a Postgres database. We are using a Postgres database for the pest things. Mm -hmm. The Redis is used as just a cache, like a queuing system. Okay, mm -hmm. mostly very simple. So that's why it's not even, I do think, elastic cache that we're using. We just try to keep the things as simple as possible. And the Postgres one is the most critical one. We store even like some events inside Postgres, but we don't store like uh, unlimited uh, type of data inside the Postgres. We really try to structure like the way that makes like recovery being able to scale uh, to uh, uh, to thousands of thousands if it, it's necessary, like with the same uh, backend, the same architectures, uh, because it's tailored like to the needs that we have today and tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, and I'm not judging. I, I respect anything. My, one of my biggest clients that did like half a billion dollars in business, uh, you know, a year gross. And uh, I mean, they, they started off with a WordPress. And so, you know, the way they started, you know, I, I can't fault them. You, what, what gets you to the finish line, what gets the job done is the right answer. So I'm, I, I merely ask uh, just because I nerd out over those things. That's a very um, good question. Uh, actually, uh, I really love like those questions and uh, like uh, super interesting one. I do think so. If I have an advice just to share with anyone, anyone that wants to start up like business, it's just trying to keep the things as simple as possible. At the beginning of recovery, actually, I did some bad like choices because I'm someone that is really passion passionate. And I try some stuff sometimes. And I, you know, sometimes you just like you, you, you are, uh, mixing up like stuff like you want to experiment some stuff but at the same time you are you have to run like you have some uh, time constraint and you you need to run production and you are just mixing up like those two things i do think it's not good now something that i'm doing for instance in my personal experience is when i want to try or experiment something i just try to keep to get uh, like a side project where i can just experiment like playing for myself and still, I want just to preserve and make sure that the, the one that is running, like the pollution, is really safe, like for our users. Yeah. So, now, I like that as almost an argument for microservices, because you can have just a service on the side that consumes events and doesn't, you know, interfere with the rest of it. And it's a great way to run little experiments. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, there's, there's arguments for and against it. And that's kind of a hot topic with people. Yeah, so. you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But, uh, no, I love, the, I love the idea of the experimentation. Um, so, let's... Talk about the future for you guys. Where, what's your, what's your plans? What's your, where are you guys going in 2023 and beyond? Yeah, that's uh, very. Thanks for asking all of that. Uh, so we did focus for since the beginning of recovery. Uh, we did focus on the AWS integration, so making sure that uh, our users, since AWS is like the biggest market share, we are targeting medium-sized company. That's great. Like just targeting and providing our solutions like tailor to AWS is great. Now we plan to support like GCP. We are actually like uh, we have released a GCP on, on a, at a early like uh, at the early phase, so early access, so you can get access to a GCP with recovery. And the plan for us is uh, we 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 don't stop to to GCP. We'll we'll go over like beyond GCP support. We want to make sure that any kinds of infrastructure, like uh, you're running your infrastructure uh, on premise or on Azure or any cloud provider, you're running with uh, with Kubernetes under the hood. So you are just managing like all of that on your own. We want to make sure that you can benefit from the recovery experience. So the plan for us will be like just to decouple. So we have some pieces, some elements that we have. Uh, we need to work on the product just to make sure that you can install recovery anywhere. That's the name, actually, it's Covery Anywhere. You will be able just to take advantage of Covery, even on your laptop, even on your Raspberry, if you want. You can just benefit from the Covery expense. The Covery expense is really, we try to make sure, so the goal is that we try to make uh, the, the engineers as close as possible to the infrastructure. It's what we call shift lifting infrastructure management, but making sure that the developers can be a bit more autonomous Obviously, it's like a different job, but that's what we do target to do. Yeah. Excellent. I like that you said on-premise in there, too, because I've got some projects that uh, they're looking at running their GPU loads for AI ML uh, on-prem because they, longer term, it's going to be cheaper. And so that's oh, yeah. uh, actually, I, I don't know, do you have any, um, I, I don't want to ask too much specifics about your clients in detail, but do you have any is anybody running GPUs and, and uh, AI oh, ML yeah. using your stuff? Oh, 
Oh, yes. But even something that you mentioned, we have customers that they're doing like a hybrid. They have like hybrid infrastructure on premise mm -hmm. and in the cloud. And they have interconnections between both. And actually what they want is just taking advantage of covering the same way as what they, did, they, they do on AWS on their own infrastructure, you see. Mm -hmm. Because they are running all those compute like a highly computational uh, workload, uh, GPU, like uh, computations, like uh, some of them that are running tests like with uh, Selenium and it's like highly computational uh, workload on their own like infrastructure and they want to benefit from the recovery experience. So yes, that's something that we already experienced. We have customers that they're running GPU, like uh, obviously the new companies in the AI space, uh, they are taking advantage. They can't afford like getting into on-premise. They are starting their business and they're building up on top of AWS and they can take advantage of recovery. So those GPU also with recovery uh, on their AWS account. Yes. Excellent. So we are Excellent. seeing both, yeah. Yeah, no, I've, I'm seeing it quite a bit too, where you've got someone that comes from academia, they got some beefy hardware sitting on their desk that can handle everything and run these big <laughs> GPU loads, but then they don't know how to kind of connect it to the cloud. And so it's good to hear that I'm not the only one that's helping people solve that problem. So, and you've got a product for it. Oh, yeah. So that's, uh, that's great. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's something that is uh, more common than than uh, what we what we think, especially with mid-sized company, we are seeing that a lot like those hybrid like infrastructure that they have in place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, excellent. Uh, well, thank you for your time. Um, let's, uh, I'm going to start wrapping up. Uh, where can people find you if they want to learn more about you and go over it? Yeah. On Twitter, by subscribing to, to your channel now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, try, I'll, yeah, I'll put links in the show notes here. <laughs> yeah, so, exactly. On, on LinkedIn, I'm also like a quite active and we have a website where they can follow like the progression of Kobe. We do share a lot of engineering stuff. So if you're interested by the way that we build Kobe in terms of architecture, we are super, we are sharing a lot of information. Actually, our product is also like 70% open source. So we have a GitHub that's accessible. You can take advantage and really the philosophy that we have at Kobe is to give back to the community. So just feel free like to reach out. And if you want to chat, you have like those different channels that you can use. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Oh, and by the way, like you should follow him on LinkedIn because just the sheer amount of content that you put out, I, I'm I, I'm a YouTuber and I'm just ashamed. I can't even imagine how fast you put it out. But thank, it's impressive. I strive to be like you there. So, <laughs> thank you. Right. Well, without further ado, uh, thank you guys all for watching and have a great day.